slightly behind the enemy right now, but it's still early. You've got time to turn this around. Hello gaming ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another Techno Babble episode, this time on a completely different subject and one I think will be high on many's field of view this year. Watchers of my last episode in the series will know I guessed correctly on the aim of Microsoft with Windows 10 and it's planned for cross play, remote play both ways. Yes you will be able to stream both Xbox One games on your PC and when they fix it the other way around with 108060 being the target. Now even though I guessed this, it was not really a hard one to see coming for a while, with Windows 10 being designed to create an ecosystem that is a Windows device rather than a PC, using a completely virtualized environment, most likely from my guess, as to how it is going to be configured with a hypervisor at its core based on Drawbridge, that the Xbox One OS is most likely already running a version thereof, means it can scale appropriately across all platforms with a unified experience. We all know another platform that follows this rule, and Apple seems to have done okay out of it. The stage demo showed that Microsoft see a phone, tablet, PC or any other device simply as a Windows device, and that very much includes the Xbox One. Also pretty much a given process is the free upgrade offer for the first 12 months of launch to go from Windows 7 or 8 into 10 for free. No word on the final retail cost after this point, but expect that to be a cheaper than previous releases for two reasons. One. Microsoft do not want another swerved OS that 8 was in many ways, and more importantly, they want to negate as much legacy work as possible. By doing this, they move the base on as far and, and as fast as possible, and tie people into the platform. And everyone likes free stuff. With the launch being around June or September, expect more info later this year at GDC, and the Xbox One Dash update from its current Windows 8 form to the new Windows 10 around the same time, but this will most likely not change a great deal from a user point of view, or a user interface point of view, more just to get the centralised kernel in place, with phones, tablets, PCs and laptops all having a free upgrade to gain advantage of the benefits of 10, then I see this being a mass surge of Windows 10 devices popping up left, right and centre and their mobile plans will certainly need that. But what does it offer us? Well, before I go into the DX12 stuff, let's hit the operating system benefits. Spartan is the new spruced up browser that Microsoft hopes will compete against Chrome and Firefox for winning back users into the Microsoft fold of browsing, and by merging it so seamlessly into a workflow, it seems that you can use it for screen grabs, citations, and a hub of work no matter which device you are using. Creating a one-size-fits-all approach is just good practice with more and more technophobic users having to use a PC of sorts each and every day. By doing this, they make the mass market easy to adopt while simultaneously flattening the learning curve of each device. This will be, for all intents and purposes, they'll feel the same. Now, aside a love of voice recognition and Cortana, for many this will feel a little jaded and meh, but this will still work if done right with the masses. Windows is still the core of many businesses and homes, and by removing the cost barrier in the long term is a win-win-win for Microsoft. But talking assistance and Halo browsers aside, it is not enough to win over the other market they are going for. They want the gamer, be them console, phone or PC to only choose Windows for all their pixel pushing fun. The Steam appearing in the Windows 10 demo from Phil Spencer was no mistake. Give the people what they want. And by showing that Steam works out of the box and offering up a new Microsoft marketplace with shared use, cross-play and streaming and even cross-buy and launches with Fable Legends being a launch X1 exclusive now shipping day one on PC also, Microsoft have an advantage that Sony do not in this regard with a completely separate revenue stream with no need to fund the messy and mostly thankless hardware fulfillment side. This is not to say that Microsoft will abandon the console space, not in the slightest. I see this as nothing more than hedging your bets. And they can. A game like Fable Legends being an X1 and PC cross launch and play means that Microsoft will see more sales from a similar dev cost and cycle, but more on that later, than just console, but more importantly it will not anger the gaming public at large. Don't expect similar deals yet with Halo 5, Quantum Break, or even more so Rise of the Tomb Raider. These will be too big and too vocal an issue to get into, but as has been seen so far with Rise and most likely sometime around Windows 10 launch, Sunset Overdrive and maybe Killer Instinct to drum up excitement and goodwill. And the staggered release on select games will most likely continue and be monitored to gauge how the market handles this. As I say, do not expect big hitters like Forza 5, but maybe Forza Horizon 2 and other games that do not quite achieve forecasted targets to make that shift at a later date, to maximise ROI. 
But aside all of the cross-play market stuff and open arm activity, what else does Windows 10 bring to the party? Well, this is a gaming channel, and thus games is what we care most about. And DX12 is exclusive to Windows 10 and obviously Xbox One. Yes, it will not have support even on 8.1. Both that and 7, most likely, will have to make do with 11.3 updates that offer up some of the benefits of DX12, but I really expect 11.3 to be exclusive to 8.1 and Windows 7 to continue using 11. The first thing that DX12 offers, and the single most important aspect, is its ability to use the CPUs of modern machines far more appropriately, but it also offers up some new features that require hardware. The big question is what these features are, and even more importantly, what CPU or GPUs have these hardware features available. The latest Maxwell cards from Nvidia all support DX12, as does all GCN 1.0 to 2.0 cards, of which both the PS4 and Xbox One are GCN 2.0. But this is a big one, and that at this point, supporting DX12, which they all will, and having full DX12 support, are not one in the same. Now, the hardware features that we know of that DX12 is bringing to the table are conservative rasterization, rastered order views, which can both be achieved in software, but as always with hardware solutions, this is slower and thus may not be used at all unless the hardware is present. Rastered order views is remarkably similar to Intel's Pixel Sync which manages the overdraw of pixels, which enables more effects in games. GPU render work is what is called embarrassingly parallel. When a scene is rendered, the pixel shaders all work at once. When this involves a transparency effect like a fence or glass, then this can get into issues resulting in poor results, slow output, and the end output even being out of order or wrong. What ROV will do is allow the software to manage the hardware on areas where blending is needed and serialize the process so that each pixel is shaded in order rather than as received, serializing the render but only on the areas needed so that performance on the entire scene is not lost, resulting in a much better looking visual along with performance not being affected on the single best things GPUs do. Order independent transparency is a good benefit in DX12 for all blending affected parts of a scene. Conservative rasterization is again not a brand new feature, but it may need new hardware to get the best out of it. Use for when collision on primitives as it can detect this without the need to use GPU resource by upping the resolution. A standard rasterization cannot know when this occurs on edge cases, it is a real problem that will help, effectively pushing voxel use more in D3D. As it will be a significant part of this process. Also, volume tiled resource is coming, which is an extension of tiled resource or mega textures or partially resident textures. There's so many names for all these things, again, minimizing memory use on parts of a texture when it's not needed or used across lots of the scene. This is a hardware feature in later GCN cards and on both consoles. Again, what hardware has all of these features, if any at all, is unknown, but we will learn more about these and any other features coming in DX12 at GDC. We do know that the benefits it offers up on performance, but these do not come for free. Working on a console API is far more work than a standard DX API as it takes care of so much more for you in DX11 that DX12 will allow developers to manage more of the render process and not micromanage it so much. DX11 has so much more state control in place, but it is wasteful. But with DX12, this will be pared back, but it will not be for everyone. And DX11.3 will allow some features to improve, but also allow devs to simply stay as close as they are now, with the option of using descriptor heat tables and the like if required, and choose when what the GPU hardware state does throughout the pipeline. Even index materials within shaders open up the possibility to have 10 times the amount at the same cost as DX11. It will not be a silver bullet for all games, so don't expect everyone to always use it and for it to improve everything within a game, as we are talking about increases within parts of the pipeline. Even on console, they have a choice to use DX11 code right from PC and do less legwork themselves. Even PS4 has a wrapper API, GNMX, that is much higher level and enables developers to code similar to DX11 paths and have all this managed within a higher VM that obviously comes at a performance cost and I'm sure many games on both consoles have and will use this now and going forward. I expect the same thing with DX12 also being used in the bigger companies but not everywhere. Brute force is always an option with PC. Also, games will need to be written for DX12 to work as intended. One such game is Fable Legends. As it is a DX12 game for both PC and Xbox One, it will be the first real game we will see that shows off the early benefits in a real game. But we have had some tests already with the Mantle test Star Swarm used to compare DX12 to Mantle itself. 
AMD's own low-level API. Now, some say that AMD wasted their time with Mantle, and now it will die due to DX12, as they will not support two separate APIs. But I'm not of that mindset. You may remember that I mentioned on my last video about the Intel and AMD CPU split, and in my AC Unity and Dying Light videos, I showed this in practice. The single biggest advantage that Intel has over AMD is its ability to run all code very well, and more importantly, single-threaded code is blinding, and as I mentioned, is down to the Intel memory structure and sleep-awake process into turbo mode. Most PC CPUs never operate anywhere near the speed they are clocked at all the time. Most apps just fire off and then wait again, and the power of a modern CPU is far in excess of what is needed most of the time. Turbo modes are when an app needs fast single core speed that have power gates that shut off part of the chip when not in use to save power heat and also allow this boost on a single core to much higher base speeds for a short time and blast through the job. And this is Intel's secret weapon over AMD and why you see even lower level CPUs beating much higher AMD ones in some games. Those being heavy on a single core, with DX11 having all communications with the GPU happen from a single core, you can see where this is going. Dying Light is a great example of it in practice. Single threaded code affects the AMD machine far more than the Intel one. But with DX12 and Mantle, this advantage is massively reduced and enables much lower spec and cheaper CPUs to be in contention once again. And this is what AMD did with Mantle. It needed DX12, but it had to motivate the market, and it did. Now, as you see below with the Star Storm test, improvements on an Intel CPU are around 67% with the i3 having pretty much 100% improvement on FPS to the AMD A8 APU. But under DX12, this advantage is gone, as the game stops being CPU bound and becomes GPU bound, with the AMD CPU seeing nearly 200% improvement and running the test identically to the Intel CPU. And this advantage is also seen in the GPU area, with the Nvidia card seeing a 150 plus improvement from DX12, but AMD again seeing up to and over 400%. Now you can see why AMD wanted this so much, as it makes the difference in CPU and GPU much smaller or removes it entirely, putting rest to the silly rumour of Nvidia teraflops are better than AMD's and such like. Mantle was, in my opinion, never meant to be anything other than a carrot. It was, and it worked. Still being in beta and most likely never coming out of it, here with a Star Swarm test, Mantle can be beaten already by DX12. And this is only good for AMD, with its APU also seeing the biggest improvements from both CPU and iGPU. But like all tests, even more so a beta like this one, running on a beta operating system and API, should only be taken as a guide and a best case scenario. Only if you are batch submission restricted will you see this kind of improvement, with the game having far more going on than just this, so no game is going to get this kind of benefit all on its own. But it will be large, far more NPCs with much better AI, richer worlds, more realistic lighting. Along with this performance game, much better things come from it. Far more draw calls means richer worlds on PC and more so on Xbox One. More lights in games with better frame rates. This will improve the hardware the lower down the food chain it is, with AMD CPUs and APUs seeing the most benefit, and then getting smaller as you move up the level. But everyone will benefit to a lesser or greater degree. But all will see the benefits in games. Mobile devices will see most likely the biggest gains, not only on performance, but power use and heat TDP, being pushed back onto the GPU where it belongs. Again, Dying Light's aggressive cutback on LOD on the consoles and dynamic light sources highlights just how effective the consoles are by this limit of single-threaded submission. See here how the split from DX11 API driver kernel leaps in DX12 as it spreads the workout over the threads. Both Xbox One and PS4 still run on the DX11 type pipeline and this change will affect them greatly as it will on PC. But many of you are probably saying that PS4 does not use DX, which is correct. It has its own GNM API and the PSSL language for graphics, but with the next gen version of OpenGL also being shown at GDC this year, with Sony as part of its members, it is always a case of whatever you can do. All the improvements we have gone through here, and thanks to Anantech for the grass, will also be in works for OpenGL and the PS4 API. So by the time DX12 hits PC and Xbox One at the end of the year with Fable Legends and Windows 10, be sure that Sony will have something ready to ship also. You don't move forward by standing still. And as I have said on previous videos, this gen will have as much if not more of a leap from early games to the end as the last one. It will. 
The Order 1886 is a game that right now is the benchmark for real-time visuals looking like pre-rendered CGI, but by the end of this generation and by Rad themselves and others it will be surpassed. This is a golden age of gaming no matter your platform and it will only get better. I will cover more on DX12, GL Next and much much more from GDC soon in another Technobabble video and others to come. As always, if you enjoyed this or any of my other content, then please hit that like and sub button. It really helps me immensely. If you did, leave comments below. I always like to reply and hear your feedback. I will comment and reply as often as I can. I've also got many more things in the pipeline at the moment, so please stick around and hopefully enjoy what I've got coming up very soon. Next up will be my The Order 1886 review and technical breakdown, and I will get that to you by next week on or just before launch and hopefully you guys and girls will enjoy it because i know i will you guys and girls take care and i'll see you soon on the next one centuries have passed but our order has remained steadfast in its sacred mission to preserve the balance between man and half-breed that balance is threatened by a new contagion the Rebellion. You have no idea who you're dealing with. All knights do arms! Let's eliminate these godless rebels once and for all. I'll need you to provide cover. We really believe the rebels are collaborating with the half-breeds. We're converging from the hospital. We need to unravel this without arousing suspicion. Incoming! Stop for a pipe, did you? Ray, where are you going? To finish what we started! This is no time for vengeance! Come to your senses! Madness. You're putting the very core of our order in jeopardy. Alistair, you have to trust me. You dance on the very edge of insubordination, Sir Knight. This matter is not yet over. Of that you can be sure.